Hello my dudes, my name is Tiffany, welcome back to my series, Internet Analysis, where I like to research and discuss things relevant to social issues and media. Today's topic is dystopian real estate content. I've realized recently that I'm not the only one who likes to just look at random apartment and housing listings, just browse around. I have been saving up some money for an eventual down payment someday, hopefully. And even though I'm not even sure where I would like to buy a house, it's just kind of fun to research and see what's out there, see what might be within my budget someday. Many of us find it fun to window shop, see what prices are like in our neighborhood or our city, whether you can actually imagine yourself moving there or if you're just dreaming, or maybe you're more so hate shopping. Look at how ugly those McMansions are. Who designed this? But with rising housing costs and wages that are definitely not keeping up with inflation, for many, it feels like nothing is realistic or affordable anymore. And sometimes this window shopping can be more than a little depressing, and dare I say, dystopian. While house tours, home DIYs, and room makeovers have dominated the YouTube scene over the past couple years, I've noticed a spike in content about real estate. Whether it's just simple tours, apartment hunting, or more specific content about how to get rich working as a real estate agent or as a real estate investor. So in today's video, we're just going to cruise through a potentially infuriating array of real estate related content. And each of these topics could be their own hour long deep dive, but I did not have the energy for that this week. I just wanted to vent. Hope you're up for it. Let's start with ridiculously expensive real estate. I'm not talking about $1 million or even $2 million homes. We're talking $25, $50, $100 million properties. Now, some of these properties are stunning, while others are more the kind of cold, creepy, billionaire weirdness style, but they all remind us just how massive the wealth and income divides are. In many cities, you've got to spend at least a million dollars just to get what used to be considered a basic starter home, and you're lucky if you can get that. But you're telling me that there are really people out here just buying houses for like tens of millions of dollars? I think we take it for granted because we're surrounded by this content all the time, but it's still very hard to fathom that. Kind of makes me want to grab my pitchfork. So that brings us to Netflix's hit show, Selling Sunset, a classic melodramatic LA reality show that showcases the glamorous lives of elite real estate agents, and also the depressing reality of real estate in big cities. What I find most interesting about Selling Sunset is not the drama, and it's not even the listings, because honestly, most of them end up looking the same after a while. Oh, another massive Hollywood Hills compound with indoor-outdoor space and an infinity pool. <laughs> I think what's most interesting about the show is how much it proves that real estate is all about who you know. It's about networking and connections. Some random new real estate agent is not going to get any of these million dollar listings. But for example, if you are an attractive woman who knows Jason and the other one, you may be lucky enough to be hired at the Oppenheim Group and start making like $200,000 per commission. Anyway, we'll talk more about real estate agents later in this video. If you are into obnoxiously extravagant and ridiculously expensive real estate, there's more where that comes from. Lots of real estate agents post videos touring listings and doing walkthroughs, and the biggest luxury real estate channel on YouTube is Eric Conover. Let's check out some of these. Five bedrooms six bathrooms, 4,600 square feet interior, 671 square feet exterior, asking $28.5 million. Just that outdoor space is the same or bigger than the average square footage of a New York City apartment. The living room is about the size of your kind of, let's say, standard three bedroom rental apartment. And that's just this living room. You're looking at some of the wealthiest people in the world. The two top apartments in this building have sold to Michael Dell for $100 million and to Bill Ackman for just over $90 million. This is only 28 and a half. So this is a steal. Let's say this is 100 square feet. The whole apartment is asking 6,200 a foot. That means that this bathroom alone costs $620,000. Some parts in this video almost sound satirical, like they're actually making fun of like luxury real estate, but then they're not. They're framing these things as good things. Below us under our feet, these are thousand year old planks of cedar. And this wood is actually from the island of Yakushima. And it's actually now illegal to harvest wood from the island as it's now a world heritage site. So to have these in your apartment, I can't drive home how rare that is. Sounds like maybe that rare precious cedar shouldn't have been made into flooring. The ultra rich really do live in completely different worlds. Hold on, let me check in on you. Are these dystopian real estate videos hurting your eyes? 
Me too. Which brings us to the sponsor of this portion of today's video, Warby Parker. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams. By the way, if you have leftover FSA or HSA dollars, you might be able to use them. Their glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. I'm using Warby Parker's free at-home try-on program. You pick five pairs of glasses to try at home for free for five days. I used their app's virtual try-on to help me pre-select which frames I think I would like best. So let's try them on, I'm so excited. These are the Clio, very secure on my nose. A little cat eye with some rose gold frames. These are the Toddy and Seaweed Crystal. These ones are so comfy. I love that they have a size range from extra narrow to extra wide because all of my frames are either wide or extra wide and they fit me so much better. Then we've got the right wide. Oh, I love the blue, the blue lenses. <laughs> Let me know which ones I should get. So if you'd like to check out Warby Parker, you can try five pairs of glasses at home for free. Just click the link in my description. Getting back into it, let's talk about bad house flips. Flip or flop, more like flip and flop, am I right? Hey, I love HGTV. The process of renovating and redesigning a space is pretty universally exciting, or at least fun to listen to in the background. But also, HGTV has helped to normalize and promote a lazier side of house flipping. Buy a fixer-upper, add some new paint, maybe some other small changes, spend as little as possible, use cheap materials that look decent but aren't great quality, and bam, resell the house for a huge profit, and then repeat. But now, it's not just the Property Brothers or any other famous HGTV hosts. Lots of people are getting in on the flipping game, and I know this is far from new, this has always been going on, but it seems like this has been gaining steam online a lot in the last few years. It doesn't really bother me that people my age are having kids, but it does bother me that people my age are starting to flip houses. It's not enough for you to just buy a house. You have to buy a house that you don't even want? Ah! <laughs> no way, I'm not there yet. It feels like everyone seems qualified to do a house flip. You know, all you need is that pesky little capital. <laughs> all you need is daddy's money or mommy's money, grandma's money. Use that little bit of cash and buy your first fixer upper. But let's be real, there's a lot that goes into renovations beyond just making aesthetic decisions. And if profit is your primary motivator, you're probably not gonna do what's best for the buyer, but rather what's best for yourself. Most you new flippers would spend way more in this kitchen than you should. We're just painting the cabinets, tossing the fridge. What would you guys do? And one of the things I hate the most about flipping content is very often we see people remove every unique, interesting, historic piece of character in a home. They just gut it all, take it away, and make it look like the same as any other house. They go for the Magnolia Homes, Target, Chip and Joanna style, which obviously is very popular for a lot of people. But it's also so boring to see so many flips essentially turned into the exact same look. Gray and white, marble, maybe a few barn doors. These flippers widen their seller's market by putting in features that are inoffensive and generally appealing to the mainstream. I get the strategy, it just makes me sad. And I hope it doesn't sound like I think I'm the most interesting, unique person in the world because I'm not. Now, hey, if this is your style, that's great. You're probably stoked looking at listings right now. But if you happen to like a little bit of color or some unique features, you probably would have preferred the before. Plus for any potential home buyers who actually would like to renovate their own home, you know, they wanna buy a fixer upper, they wanna do the work themselves or hire, you know, a contractor themselves. Many of these homes are already being bought up by flippers and investors. So I'm worried that we're gonna run out of homes with character. You know, we, we will never lack new builds builds, or at least something built in the last 10, 20 years. But we won't be able to preserve older homes, historic homes with character, unless they're protected. Because at this rate, they're all just getting bought up and magnolia We have a home character crisis. Think of the children. They'll never see wainscoting, fully mirrored 70s basement, or way too much wood paneling. My favorite is like this kind of vintage pink and green, Cosmo Wanda, like bathroom aesthetic. I'm a sucker for it. What I am a fan of though, are the people who actually want to maintain the historic elements of different homes. So there are, you know, industries dedicated to this. And again, if you're living in like a protected historic home, you do have to actually stick to certain rules and regulations. Of course, the features can't always be 100% original, but at least you're trying to maintain the original look or integrity. Though I can totally understand that this is probably prohibitively expensive for the average buyer. So I look at historic houses and I'm like, oh my God, that looks so cute. 
but what if like all the structure is rotting? Anyway, aside from just aesthetic preferences, sometimes the reno work on these flips are just not done well. If the work is shoddy, it can cause major problems. It would suck to buy a home that claims to be newly renovated but ends up having a ton of work that needs to be redone or repaired. By the way, We're in Hell made a really great video about this house flipping reality show recently. It's specifically about flipping into short-term vacation rentals and how that contributes to gentrification. Great stuff. Check it out. Speaking of shitty flips, we've got to get into the whole Zillow saga. So Zillow bought up a ton of homes, barely renovated them, and then hugely increased the price when reselling, allegedly trying to artificially inflate the market. Their goal was to not only dominate the online house search domain, but also to monopolize much of buying and selling. Luckily though, it backfired. Zillow announced that its home buying division offers had lost more than $300 million over the last few months. Offers will now be shut down and about 2,000 people laid off. Zillow reportedly has about 7,000 homes that it now needs to unload, many for prices lower than it originally paid. Though I have my schadenfreude about Zillow, it really sucks that 2,000 people had to lose their jobs because their company was reckless and greedy. So Zillow was engaging in what is called iBuying, which is basically algorithm-powered home buying. A source in this article says, this is an arms race right now of who will become the Amazon of real estate. Please no. Dystopian. Enormous companies with deep pockets and mounds of data bidding against ordinary people in an already absurd housing market? It sounds like a nightmare for anyone who isn't a tech investor. Yeah, exactly. But if Zillow has to sell these homes at a loss now, that's gotta be good for people, right? Right? Sorry, unlikely. Those 7,000 homes Zillow is sitting on? Bloomberg reports that they will probably be offloaded to institutional investors like BlackRock rather than regular people. Next up, house hacking. House hacking is a concept I first heard from YouTube's own Graham Stephan, who also is part of the Oppenheim group at Selling Sunset. Actually, I don't know if he's still a part of it. At one point he was. But house hacking is also extremely popular on TikTok. Basically, if you can scrape together a minimum down payment, you can buy a house, move in, and then, oh, you've got some empty rooms? Get some roommates. But wait, the real hack is being able to live rent-free. How? All you've gotta do is overcharge your roommates and let them pay for the entirety of your mortgage. Now that's iconic landlord behavior. How can you even afford this thing? I'm not paying anything, I'm house hacking. You live here for free? She doesn't know how to house hack, watch this. House hacking? I bought this house and I'm renting out the extra bedrooms. I rent it out to you three roommates who each pay $600 a month. And your rent covers all of my mortgage and gives me some money in my pocket. But you don't pay any portion of the rent. I live 100% free. It's called house hacking. So I'm paying you to live here for free. That's right and then eventually i'll sell the place and make a big profit who taught you how to do this addison did who taught you that addison did it's because it's because i follow brianna you're super helpful for a beginner like me i'm definitely following you why do all of these terrible skits end with them complimenting their own genius tips you weirdos when i first saw these tiktoks i was like okay there's no way that they really paint themselves as the villain that blatantly but yes they do Hey, stupid roommate, did you realize that you pay my mortgage so that I can sit on my ass making TikToks about how rich I am? <laughs> Sucks to be working class, loser. And if you want an even better house hack, you've got to buy a multifamily unit like a duplex. If you're smart, you don't want to buy this. Instead, you want to buy this. You see, this is a duplex, so you can live on one side, rent out the other side. The rent from the second unit will cover most of the mortgage payment, allowing you to live in the first unit almost for free. I bought this duplex, I also bought this duplex, and bought this triplex, and I bought this sevenplex. So now I could buy this, and this, and these. Now this is a really cool hack because that means you get to profit from even more working class people all at the same time. Eventually you can buy up dozens of units and help raise the rents and gentrify like an entire neighborhood. But don't feel sorry for your tenants. If they didn't want to pay rent to a cool landlord such as yourself, they would just buy their own house. <laughs> Duh. By the way, I want to give a shout out to my friend Kel Gore. She has a really great series called Owned where she talks about this kind of content. Her video about landlord TikTok is perfect. Literally, she said everything better than I could. So I highly recommend watching that one after this. She also has an episode about a landlord who exploits section eight for his own personal gain. And that one was horrifying. Before I end this section, I just want to say, I totally understand everyone's desperation to want to be able to buy a home. But this house hacking advice is not about 
getting one major asset for yourself or your family to have that security, hopefully. It's about how to take advantage of real estate loopholes and how to hoard as many homes as possible just for your own profit, even though you are directly exploiting and harming the tenants who are paying your bills. Live, laugh, landlord. Continuing on, I've seen a good bit of content about tiny, barely livable spaces. Because housing is so expensive, many of us have lowered our standards for what we want or what we need to be able to survive comfortably. Maybe you used to own of dreaming a house, but now you're like, hey, I'm fine in an apartment. And plus, if you become more of a minimalist, you don't need that much space, right? And honestly, those of us who can reliably pay our rent every month are some of the most fortunate. But you know, we tell ourselves, this is fine, this is great. We do our best with what we can afford. So I wanted to start with this tiny New York City artist apartment. Let's look at it. I'm sure there's some compromises, but uh, it's worth it. It's 90 square feet. There's no kitchen, but I've created my own little kitchen, little fridge. The first night I slept in the apartment, I had a panic attack. When I woke up, there was a ceiling here and the wall on every side. It might be technically functional enough, but it's not ideal. And having to force yourself to get over claustrophobia in order to be able to sleep in your bed where your head is probably a few inches from the ceiling it's a very simple statement, but I just think that it sucks that people are forced to make these tough decisions in order to be able to afford rent. A lot of the other videos that I found about tiny apartments were in Tokyo, which has very expensive real estate. This place here, we'll call it, call it cozy. This is the entire room right here. It's only 15 meters squared. Aside from the lack of hot water, there's no air conditioner. You may have also noticed there's no bathroom in here, no shower, no toilet. Speaking of safety, that's another big part is basically that the building, there's a good chance it would not hold up well in an earthquake. I'm pretty sure the bathroom is down that way. And it looks like, yeah, that's the library right there. They have washrooms on each floor of the library, but the library and the washrooms are only open until 7 p.m. So again, that place is not safe for earthquakes. No bathroom in the building, let alone your own unit. I don't think that that checks the, the boxes of being livable. While watching these, I'm really resisting the urge to just be like, oh, at least they're housed. Because yes, of course, being housed, having shelter is better than not. But still, living situations like this, I cannot imagine how uncomfortable or stressful they might be. And I just feel like people deserve a little bit more comfort, like more than just the bare minimum of a roof over your head in order to live and be well. Is that asking too much? I feel like it is. I'm like, whoa, 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 tone it down. <laughs> in the same video where we're talking about $50 million mansions, wanting a teeny bit of space or light or something is a big ask. All right, so this is it here. The real shocker is the room <laughs> itself. There's the bed, that's it. It's just that right there. And this is your shower with your toilet. Sorry, I instantly <laughs> got distracted as soon as I walked into this room. What is this? I have never seen an apartment like this before. How does this even? Okay, so they told me the toilet was in a bit of a tight space. On the Can you move is this? But some people just don't need bigger spaces. But honestly, this bath is everything. So everything I do, like watching movies or drinking, is done while taking a bath. Meals, movies, everything in the tub. This video is interesting because the two students that are shown who live in this building are both architecture students. And it's kind of interesting that they chose to live here. It almost seems like they saw it as like a bit of a challenge to figure out how to maximize the space and give them inspiration for their studies. And they do obviously see their units as suitable for what they need. I don't think those two were the worst examples or like unlivable, but some of the other examples seemed a little bit, I don't know, just for me, like, you know, I, I would get a little claustrophobic maybe. But some people are fine with very small living spaces and they'd rather just kind of sleep and then live the rest of their life outside of their home, which is fine. I think the distinction I'm trying to make is, say you work minimum wage and if you were able to afford a standard basic apartment with all the amenities but you chose to live in a smaller cheaper place because that's what you wanted that's one thing but the difference between having that choice to live smaller or live in a quirky little space is very different from not having the option 
and not being able to afford a basic standard apartment. But speaking of, if you're the type of person who just, you know, you just want a place to crash, let's introduce you to pod living. Thousands of young people are giving up traditional housing in favor of living in a pod, a hostel-like living experience that confines their sleeping quarters to a nook in a room full of similar nomads. Classic digital nomads, am I right? Now, of course, hostels can be great for traveling. I've used them before. It's kind of fun when you're young, especially. But I would find it difficult to live in a setting like that long term, let alone while actually working and living life versus when you're just kind of traveling and just need a place to crash. Apparently, though, some of these pod, pod sharers have loved the concept so much that they've gotten tattoos of the company's logo. A company would have to pay me literally a lifetime wage if I were going to be advertising them on my body forever. And even then, well, probably, <laughs> probably worth it, actually. I'm very surprised that more companies haven't invested in the advertising space and billboards of human skin, but that's kind of another topic. From the articles I read about this, this company seems to like to brand itself as like the new fun millennial way of living. Millennials just love freelancing and flexibility. We don't want to be tied down. They love taking Uber rides and living in pods, not because they can't afford a car or their own private housing, but because they're young and wild and free. And like I mentioned in my van life video, the housing status of these pod residents is debatable. They could be considered well off, but they are also in a way homeless by choice. In some markets, I don't think this pod thing would really make sense to you, but for example, in San Francisco, which is one of the most competitive and expensive housing markets, a pod bed there costs about $1,400 per month, which is so much cheaper than any studio or one bedroom that you'd ever be able to find. So it's like, okay, how much are you willing to spend to live in a room in an apartment full of roommates? Or do you just want your little pod, your cool bunk bed with your other co-living friends? I think it is fair to call this concept dystopian. If you are voluntarily living like this or it's a cool option for you while you're traveling or living somewhere very short term, that's great. And also if you do value living in some kind of a co-living space like this, all the power to you. But if this is your only option because housing is so unaffordable, that's a different story. That's that's the, the false illusion of choice. Oh, I'm choosing to live this way. It's like, no, you can't afford anything else. So this is, this is the option. For another tangent, this all reminded me of the recent news scandal about UC Santa Barbara's dorms. Basically, they were designed by a billionaire who is bankrolling part of the project and insists that his plans must be followed 100% or he's not putting up any money. And they're basically made up of a small room per person. Oh, cool, you get your own room. It has a bed, a desk, it has no windows, standards stuff. Oh wait, did you say no windows? Yes, this billionaire believes that fresh air and natural light are luxuries. It's more efficient to remove the windows and just place a screen that can mimic light. Dystopian indeed. Why would we ever consider the quality of human life when developing housing? No, the bottom line and return on investment is far more important. By cutting simple corners like windows, emergency exits, and hallways wider than one human body, you can create the most cost-efficient housing per person on a college campus. One of the architects on the project actually quit because of this, calling the project a social and psychological experiment with an unknown impact on the lives and personal development of students. And a lot of people have reacted to or responded to this. This news is like a couple months old now, I know. I'm not saying anything new here. It is definitely possible to build livable and comfortable, small, efficient spaces, but it is also very easy for efficiency-obsessed buildings to turn into, let's just shove people into tiny spaces with nothing more than the bare minimum. And let's also redefine what the bare minimum is. Can we make that lower? Can we make it cheaper? I think in this situation, especially we're dealing with a college dorm, we're talking about students who are already under a great amount of stress. It's a very tumultuous time. Students already suffer from a lot of mental health issues. I can't think of anything worse than confining myself to be alone in a small windowless room. And finally, final thoughts. First of all, one more tangent, of course. While we're on the topic of housing, I've been watching a lot of like city planning videos lately. I just wanna say, I hate the way that suburbs have been designed and built across the United States. The sprawl is terrible. It forces us to be car dependent. It makes it very difficult or impossible to walk or bike anywhere. So after watching these videos, I'm now not only dreaming of owning a home someday somewhere, but also of the perfect walkable, bikeable, safe for people community. 
with like a little locally owned coffee shop and a bakery and a residential area, a little mixed use community. Does that exist in the US? If so, I probably can't afford it. So uh, we're back to square one. Secondly, the housing market just seems fake and I'm tired of it. All of this just seems like fake numbers and fake valuations. Money isn't real, <laughs> time isn't real, so. I'm not gonna pretend to understand how the housing market actually functions, more than just a general surface level understanding, but it just seems ludicrous and harmful to society for houses to increase in value by like 50 or 100% in a year or two, when the normal rate is like 2%? Seems pretty fucked to me. Third, housing is a human right. There are more than enough homes to house everyone, but that is not the aim of the housing market. Housing has been commodified, so it caters to people like these investors who get to hoard as much property as they can, leverage their debts against each other, get tax-free cash out of it, and then they continue to make bank from essentially just playing with money while renters are forced to pay them more every year. There's no way to consume real estate content, anything about the housing market without getting to this point and just being angry. Well, unless you're the capitalist who wants to like profit from it, then I guess you're like stoked about it. And that brings my last point. Yes, we all have no choice but to make some money so that we can survive under capitalism. But I would say like at least try to not make your money by directly exploiting people's basic needs, such as housing. It's funny because so much of this content is directed toward like broke people, young people, and instead of having class solidarity and trying to work together to address these issues, for the betterment of us all, young people are being sold a very individualistic, very capitalist narrative. You know, if you can't beat them, join them. Don't complain about rising housing costs. Directly contribute to and profit from that problem. And by the way, in writing this, I almost changed this entire concept to just focus on wannabe investors on TikTok, happy capitalists, and the cult of passive income. So I will save all of that for a future video. It'll kind of be like these guys. So I thought I was doing a lot. I had 60 rental properties and about $10 million in real estate on, but wait one minute. Uh, 220 houses, 25 million. Boom. About 1,500 units, 45 million. Boom. 4,288 oh. units, $335 million. Boom. Oh. That video hurts. Those guys are so dorky, but they think they're so cool. I mean, nobody tell them, actually tell them. <laughs> So finally, I wanna give a shout out to my patrons. If you wanna support my work and come see some bonus content, you can do that there. Very much appreciate you guys. Extra big thank you to these patrons, Casey Luck, VivianOladon.com, Jeff, Face, Jaden, Marty Schmeichel, Abby Hayden, and Rebecca DeVilliers. And one last thank you to today's sponsor, Warby Parker. If you need some glasses, click the link in the description, do a home try on, take care of your eyes. Stay tuned for more internet analysis videos. Okay, thanks, bye.